Good morning. This is the worship service for Centenary United Methodist Church in Bath, New York for July 26, 2020. In our announcements this week, I would just like to remind everyone we have our Bible study at 10 a.m. on Wednesday as well as 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evening. Both are offered here at the church as well as on Zoom. You just need to um, get on our Facebook page, Bath Centenary United UMC, to find the link to the Zoom. Um, we also would like to remind everyone that we are still having church and we are still reaching out to our community. And we want to thank you for your giving and generosity during this time that keeps us um, in ministry and able to pay not just our bills, but also take care of those people who come to us in need. And so our offering, um, we invite you online to send it into the church at 3 West Washington Street, Bath, New York, 14810. And we also still have those envelopes, that special offering and fundraiser that we had started before the pandemic. And so those um, envelopes are still here at the church. And if you still have one in your possession, we invite you to mail that in as well. With that, we ask that you take a deep breath and release it, releasing all of our worries and cares, offering them to God who knows what we need before we ask. And then inhale his grace his mercy and his love. For here we are, Lord, to worship you. Receive our call to worship. The Spirit of God gave the universe birth. The Spirit of God delivered the world. Our God is the first, and our God is the last. No other God declares the word of creation. Yet this same God invites us, saying, do not be afraid. Worship the one who banishes fear, who comforts the trembling and quickens the faint. Worship the one whose creation is renewed and whose creatures are never forsaken. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we are here to worship you. In the midst of all the chaos of our world, in the midst of this pandemic, and in the midst of the cultural turmoil and chaos, we know that you are the God of creation who speaks order and light into the chaos and the darkness. And so let us hear your words speak to us once more, order and light. Help us to join your story. The story of a God who creates and redeems and invites us to be part of your creative and redemptive work. We come to worship you now and join your story. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn that we'll be singing this morning is Love to Tell the Story, which is in the United Methodist Hymnal, page 156.
Our scripture lesson today is from Romans chapter 10. We have been journeying for the past couple months through the book of Romans. And so today we reach chapter 10, and I will be reading verses 4 through 13, and I'm going to read it from the message. I usually use the NRSV, and I usually use um, the Common English Bible, but um, Paul gets into some deep things here in Romans 9 through 11, and I want to um, make it as easy to understand for everyone. And so I'm using the message, which is a paraphrase of Scripture. So this is Romans chapter 10, verses 4 through 13, according to the message. The earlier revelation was intended simply to get us ready for the Messiah, who then puts everything right for those who trust him to do it. Moses wrote that anyone who insists on using the law code to live right before God soon discovers it's not so easy. Every detail of life regulated by fine print. But trusting God to shape the right living in us is a different story. No precarious climb up to heaven to recruit the Messiah. No dangerous descent into hell to rescue the Messiah. So what exactly was Moses saying? The word that saves is right here. As near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest. It's the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and sets things right for us. This is the core of our preaching. Say the welcoming word to God. Jesus is my Lord, my master, embracing body and soul. God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything. You're simply calling out to God. Trusting him to do it for you. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God setting things right. And then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between me and him. Scripture reassures us. No one who trusts God like this, heart and soul, will ever regret it. It's exactly the same no matter what a person's religious background may be. The same God for all of us, acting the same incredibly generous way to everyone who calls out for help. Everyone who calls help God gets helped. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, here we are. You are the one who has the words of life. And we are your children. Come and speak to us today, we pray. Amen. Last week we were talking about Romans 9 and how in Romans 9, um, Paul has kind of changed directions, it seems like, in Romans. Romans 1 through 7, he has been telling us that all humanity Gentile and Jew alike stand condemned. We're condemned by nature and creation because we did not keep the covenant with God and creation that we were given in creation to reflect God's image and be the gardener, keeping the chaos and the or chaos, chaos out and the order in and the light in and the darkness out. We didn't do that, so we stand judged. And then we have the law that was given to the Jewish people. And this law, somehow even the Gentiles knew that certain things were wrong, and so the law condemns them. But the Jews had this special revelation from God, and they were unable to keep it, and that stands in condemnation of them. And so we need some kind of help. And when we get to Romans 4 and 5, we find out that it's God in Jesus Christ that offers us that salvation, that way home. God has set things right in Jesus Christ. And now, when we, by faith, receive Christ, God sets things right for us. And in Romans 7, we find out that even though Christ has come and made a way for us to be right with God and right with each other, we still fail. We, we get into that cycle of doing the things we know we shouldn't do and not doing the things that we know we should do. And we need some kind of help. And in Romans 8, Paul gives us this amazing, amazing chapter of what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God comes into us. We are now 
children of God, and we are filled with his spirit, and by the spirit we are able to live out the ways of God. Because God is in us changing our heart and changing our DNA. God is taking us from being self-centered people and setting us right. And now we are centered on God. And when we're filled with the Spirit and moved by the Spirit, we will live God-centered lives that is right side up in an upside down world. And now we can live that out because we are sure of God's love. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Then Paul turns the page in chapter 9 and he starts talking about Israel because, well, as we go through the story, what is God doing with Israel? Because Israel was promised the Messiah, but Israel has rejected the Messiah. But the Gentiles are embracing this Messiah to Israel. And so Paul is going to deal with this issue, and he's not just dealing with that issue of has God dropped his promises to Israel, he's also dealing with the issue of, we would call it racism today, but they didn't have that fancy ter terminology back then. It was this prejudice. The Romans saw themselves as better than everyone else. They were the epitome of what humanity should be, and so, they saw the Jewish people and the Arab people and everybody else as barbarians and they have conquered the land of Israel and Egypt and Northern Africa and brought peace and, and rescued those people from their flailing. And, and so Rome is looking down their nose at the rest of the world and even though the Jewish people are in the Roman Empire, they are not equal to Roman citizens and therefore they're not treated the same. And so you have the Romans looking down at the Jews and then the Jews in their traditions see it as those Gentiles, they're dogs, they're unclean, they're not the chosen people. And so you have this tension between races that are built up in the culture of that time. And Paul does not want that in the church. Because we know that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female, neither rich or poor, slave or free. In Christ we are one. And so Paul is also dealing with that in the Roman church, that they know that there is not this, well, now we're the Gentiles and we're the chosen ones, look down at the Jews. That's not what he wants them to do. And so he's pulling in a talk, talking about God's relationship with Israel, and now our understanding of Israel and God working in Israel. And in Romans 9, one of the things he does is he, well, kind of like when you have traveled with a map, this is showing how old I am, there was a time in my life when I started driving that I didn't have GPS. And thankfully it didn't last long, but we had to use those paper map, maps, and we had to pull it out and highlight our trip, and if you ever get lost on your way, you pull it back out and you try to find where you are, and then you trace back until you find where you're supposed to be and how you can get there, get back on track. Paul has ended up in a story in a new place because back in his Jewish roots, God promised a Messiah to the Jewish people, and it looked like what God was going to do was have everybody come to Israel. Israel would be the light and that beacon to the world, and people would come to Mount Zion to worship God, and they would become Jewish. They would convert to, to follow the Jewish Yahweh. They would leave what they had behind to become Jewish. But now what has happened is this Jesus has broken into the world, and Paul believes this is God breaking into the world and changing things, and no longer are we called to have to become Jewish and, and follow the Jewish way. We are now seeing God work in different ways and, and exploding amongst the Gentiles. And so Paul's wrestling with this. 
How did we get here when the map we thought was going to take us in a different place? And so he starts to trace his roots back and the story back. And in Romans 9, he goes back to the fact that God chose Abraham, and that was odd, because if you're going to start a nation, you need to have more than one kid. And so God took a couple that was childless, old beyond childbearing years, and gave them one child. And then from that is going to start a nation. Then out of Abraham's line, God does this crazy thing of choosing the youngest child, Jacob, David. And then he doesn't even stay within the line of Israel. He brings in Ruth, who is a Moabitess. And so God is choosing these people that nobody expects to bring about God's purpose of salvation. And so we watch how God is doing that. So God using Jesus, nobody expected. The Jewish people missed it. They, the Jewish leaders tripped up over Jesus, according to Romans 9, and, and they missed Jesus right in front of them, God working amongst them. And God is now using Gentiles. But that's kind of how it works, the unexpected people God uses. The un, those that people call unloved, God calls beloved. Those that God calls nobodies become somebodies. Now here in Romans 10, Paul is going to go back to that map and he's going to trace it again. But this time he's not going to trace it like nine, looking at who God uses. But he's going to take us back in the story of Israel. And as we go, we're going to find that Paul kind of is relating to Deuteronomy. He's pointing back to Deuteronomy 30. Now once all these things happen to you, the blessing and the curse that I'm setting before you, you must call them to mind as you sit among the various nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you must return to the Lord your God, obeying his voice in line with all that I'm commanding you right now, you and your children, with all your mind and with all your being. Then the Lord your God will restore you as you were before and will have compassion on you, gathering you up from all the peoples where the Lord your God scattered you. Even if he has driven you to the far end of heaven, the Lord your God will gather you up from there. He will take you back from there. The Lord your God will bring you home to the land that your ancestors possessed. And you will possess it all again. And he will do good things among you and making you more numerous than your ancestors. Then the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you love the Lord your God with all your mind and with all your being in order that you may live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you and chase you, but you will change and obey the Lord's voice and do all his commandments that I'm commanding you right now. That is Deuteronomy 30. So what Moses is saying there, we believe it's Moses saying that to the people of Israel before he dies. He says, listen, if you don't keep the law, the land's going to spew you out. But when that happens, just turn to God and God's going to bring you back to the land. God is going to be faithful to keep his promises. So just call out to God. And when God returns you to the land, he's going to do something new. He's going to circumcise your hearts. Circumcision was the sign, the outward sign, that male Jews take to, to show that they are Jews. This is their evidence that they are a marked people and called and set apart. But God is talking about circumcising the heart here. That the law and being a Jew and being chosen is no longer going to be this outward thing. It's going to be an inward thing. That there is this promise way back in Deuteronomy that God's not going to have the people living off of the rules that are outside of them, but their hearts are going to be transformed. So Paul has traced back now to Deuteronomy and Moses teaching this line that God
God really always has intended to change our hearts to change us on the inside, that these outward laws, these Ten Commandments and those laws that were given to Israel were given to prepare us for the Messiah who was going to actually bring the full change. We could not keep it because we were still self-centered trying to keep the perfect law of God. We couldn't do it because we were still focused on ourselves. We were still motivated by fear. We were still in this place motivated by the law. You've been wrong, and you stepped out of line, and that alarm going off. But now, with Jesus, God is changing our hearts so that I don't sit there and say I don't murder people because the Bible says I shouldn't. But now I say, you know, I don't murder people. Because I believe God is life. God is the life. Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if life is sacred, I will not take it. I will not snuff it out. I will not take someone else's life. I do not steal because my God is the God who provides. And I will not take what God has provided for someone else, for myself. I will live not because the Bible says so, but because God has changed who I am. And now I am one who wants to reflect the love and grace and mercy of God. I do that because God has changed my heart, changed my attitude, and is now turning me to be God-centered rather than self-centered, to be motivated by love rather than be motivated by fear of what I'm going to lose. I am motivated by love to offer to everyone life and peace and hope, to make their lives better because I am in covenant with God again in right relationship with God and right relationship with humanity because I've had a change of heart in who I am and that has been God's story from the beginning it's back here in Moses we go through all of Joshua and the stories of the kings and the stories of the prophets and then we get to Jesus and that promise that Moses offers that you'll come back to the land and God is going to change your heart happens in Jesus Christ. That now God is working in a new way and now our hearts are changed. And so here in Romans chapter 10, Paul is talking about that. The word, that word, that salvation, that saving word is as near as your tongue and as close as the heart in your chest. It is right there calling out to God for help. God comes, saves us when we confess Christ with our mouth, changes our heart and our focus to being God-centered and circumcises our heart marks us as God's own people and changes how we see the world and changes how we interact. That law was a tutor showing us what life in the kingdom looks like. It doesn't murder, life in the kingdom doesn't steal, it doesn't cheat, it rests. People can rest and have the Sabbath in the kingdom. We are not motivated by money and motivated by work. We we're not identified by that. We are identified as people who deserve rest and people who are invited to rest in their relationship with God and all of creation. This is what the kingdom looks like. And now, because God's changing my heart, I can live this out. And that is what Romans 10 is getting to, that God is doing exactly what he promised the Jewish people back in Deuteronomy. He's now changing our heart. He 
He's changing our focus. And so God has not been unfaithful to Israel. In fact, God has fulfilled his promise, and Israel is not left out of that promise. Israel is part of this promise, and God is working. He'll use whoever will make themselves available. He will use whoever to bring about his plan and purpose. God's plan and purpose of salvation all along has to change our hearts, not to give us outward rules, but to make us a people who love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and, with, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And in doing that, Jesus says, you fulfill the entire law by being motivated by love. Christianity is a tough thing because I believe Christianity actually believes we can change the world, that the whole world can change, that the world can be an expression of God's kingdom. And Christianity believes it can change the world by changing one heart at a time, and his call is to change my heart first. I would rather he started with you, but he calls me to do the changing first. We are all invited to participate in the kingdom of God and bring life and healing and order and hope and light. You are invited to join the work of God and let the Spirit of God change your heart and make you from go, go from being self-centered to being God-centered and to live in the freedom of love. You no longer have to fear people are taking from you, fear what you're going to lose. Jesus says, come and love freely. And whatever is lost in this life will be will be rewarded in the end. Those who hold on to their life lose it. Those who let go of their life are able to find it. That's the promise of Jesus. God calls us to join this revolution, this new way of living, no longer being motivated by fear, no longer being motivated by that rule keeping, but instead letting God change us so that we are in right relationship with God and right relationship with all of creation and each other. Come and be part of this new movement of Christ, changing us to be people of peacemaking and love and hope, patience, self-control. Come and be a people set free from the fear and the the anger and the way of sin. You are invited to be free in Christ. Amen.
May they find ways forward in the midst of this virus and the economic problems and the cultural and social challenges to be agents of peacemaking and hope, bringing shalom, wholeness for everyone so that all may participate, all may find ways to use their gifts and talents, all may participate in our world. We pray, Lord Jesus, for this virus, that you would be with doctors and nurses and those researching, that you would guide them and direct them in their seeking for a cure. Lead them the right way. Lead them to that vaccine, the way forward to stop this virus. And we pray that our capitalism doesn't get in the way of keeping the cure for only those who can afford it, for helping people line their pockets instead of lining the world with health and hope. We pray, Lord Jesus, for those we know in our lives that are needing your healing touch. We name them now to you. Laura, Linda, Brigida, Maddie, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, those who are grieving the loss of a job, the loss of ability, the loss of the way life used to be. We name them for you now. The Cornells, the Leeches, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, of mercy and grace, be with those who are needing hope, needing direction, seeking for a new way. May you be the light in their world. Shine your light on the talents and gifts you've given them and on the doorways that are opening for them so they can see the way forward. We name them for you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. We thank you, O oh God, that you are leading your church in new ways. It is not the traditional way we worship. It is not the same way it used to feel. But you are not confined by tradition. You are not confined by our expectation. So Holy Spirit, fall. Fall fresh on our Bishop Mark Webb, on our District Superintendent Jeff McDowell, and on all of us, your people, here in Bath, New York, and around the world, who call ourselves Christ followers, who are disciples of Christ. For your glory, change our hearts, move in us, and help us to know you better so we might reflect you to our world. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Leslie will come and sing for us our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation, which you will find on the United Methodist Hymn Book at page 529. 